Well, good morning. My name is Steve McConnell again. I haven't changed since I was <laughs> up here a few minutes ago. And it's my privilege to read to you the scripture from today's lectionary, which comes from Romans chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. Hear the word of God. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we, ought, as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with groanings too deep for words. And God, who searches hearts, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he also called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So what then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, how will he not with him also give us everything else? And who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. It is Christ who died, or rather who was raised, who is also at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. And who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long, we are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than victorious through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. By your grace, O oh Lord, we pray that we may discover once again what this great text might mean for us what it might mean despite whatever the circumstances might be in our lives, what it might mean for us to know that we are not separated from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Open our hearts, for we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. In November of 1975, a reporter for the Associated Press was walking up Jefferson Avenue in downtown Detroit and passed by the old Mariner's Church right there on the Detroit River. And as he passed by the church, he heard the bell toll. He heard the bell toll in the middle of the day, not a Sunday, the bell was tolling. And the reporter grew curious because the bell kept tolling, so he went and knocked on the front door of the church, and eventually the rector came to the door, and the reporter asked, why had the bell been tolling? The rector explained that the bell had tolled 29 times for the victims, 29 seamen, who just the day before had perished in the seas of Lake Superior in the wreck of the great cargo liner, the Edmund Fitzgerald, one of the great disasters of Great Lakes maritime history. The reporter got interested in the story, did some research, published several articles about the disaster, and a Canadian songwriter and performer, Gordon Lightfoot, who died just this past year, picked up and read one of the articles and decided to write a song about the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. It's a song that ended up over six minutes in length, usually a death nail for any song hoping to be played on the radio. But Mr. Lightfoot's storytelling and haunting melody lifted the song to number two on the charts in 1976. A Michigan boy, as I was, who grew up watching those freighters pass down the shipping lanes to Detroit, I listened to that song enough times to wear grooves through the record's vinyl, back in the day when they had vinyl. As Mr. Lightfoot tells the story in his song explaining the hurricane gale winds and the cavernous waves of Lake Superior and the possible ways by which the great ship might have sunk, he pauses in the song 
to think about all the factors that kept the crew from being rescued and then asks this question. Does anyone know where the love of God goes when the waves turn the minutes to hours? Good question. An important question, maybe a universal question that gets asked in the face of life's misfortune and tragedy. Does anyone know where the love of God goes? Does anyone know where the love of God goes when bad things happen? Does anyone know where the love of God goes when 7 million people die of COVID? Does anyone know where the love of God goes when a father in his prime dies in a car accident? Does anyone know where the love of God goes when jetliners splice skyscrapers? Does anyone know where the love of God goes when an elementary school child dies of leukemia? Does anyone know where the love of God goes when the chemistry in a person's brain sinks them into depression? Does anyone know where the love of God goes? I grew up knowing a kid named Mike. Mike and I were not the closest of friends. We hung out with different people. In middle school, Mike began to dabble with pills and pot, and that kept him that got him in trouble with the powers that be at home and certainly the powers that be at school. In high school, he fell behind in his grades and seemed to grow more and more isolated. And then one day we learned that when his parents came home late one night, they found him inside the garage sitting in his car with the car running and the garage door closed. We filled the church a few days later and asked, does anyone know where the love of God goes? You can't blame that sanctuary of high school kids asking that question, can you? You can't blame us because, you know, for most of us, whether we are 16 or 60, we can be lulled into thinking that the love of God is all about the fortunes of life, about the good times, about the pleasant moments. That the love of God is found in a beautiful day, a, a laugh with friends, a familiar song, bows at the marriage altar, the birth of a child, a rousing song, travels to beautiful parts of the world, wrestling with your grandchildren. Life feels good, and with that, we feel that this must be the love of God. But then when life seems to go the other way, when the blue sky turns gray, or when someone's life ends early, or a partner leaves, or a friend forgets, or a doctor shares the bad news, or war breaks out, or a pandemic spreads, all of a sudden it's, does anyone know where the love of God goes? It's a legitimate question. If life can be good sometimes, why can it not be good all the time? Which I suppose is the question that the Apostle Paul contended with throughout a great portion of his life. Life for Paul was not a cakewalk. It was more like a roller coaster without brakes. From the moment he was seized by the voice of Jesus and claimed as an apostle, life just got hard. When writing the Corinthians, he listed his travails five times flogged, three times beaten, once stoned, shipwrecked three times, imprisoned more than he could count. The list just keeps going. So he speaks from experience when he writes to the saints in Rome who themselves were living their lives under the shadows of the evil empire, under threats of persecution and being thrown to the lions. Paul writes to the Romans, and at some point along the way, he knows he has to face this question. Does anyone know where the love of God goes? When the world pushes back, when life gets in the way, when bad pushes against good, when right pushes against wrong, when hate pushes against love, when ugliness pushes against beauty, does anyone know where the love of God goes? Paul has to deal with that question because there is no one who believes more in the love of God than the Apostle Paul. Paul wrote the most quoted passage about love, 1 Corinthians 13. It is who God was for Paul. God was love. So what then are we to say to all these calamities, Paul rhetorically asked. How do we make sense of the backlash, the pushback, the heartache? And so he writes these words. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? 
will affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword. No, in all these things, he writes, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced, he writes, that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing will separate us from the love of God, Paul says. Not death, and then more to the point, Paul says, not even life. Not even life will separate us from the love of God. Life with all of its pushback and its disappointment and its sunken ships and its tragedy and its loss and our dumb choices and all our pettiness and prejudice. Paul says that not even life itself will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord, which is to suggest, I suppose, that when we talk about the love of God, it is not the favor of God we're talking about. It's not the blessings of God we're talking about. It's not the answered prayers of God we're talking about. When we're talking about the love of God, we are talking about the hold we have from God the belonging we have to God. That in Jesus Christ, we belong to God. That the visit of God in Christ upon this world, the teaching of God in Christ to this world, the death of Christ, God in Christ for this world, the raising of God in Christ over this world is all to show us that we belong to God. Life cannot take us anywhere where we do not belong to God. The psalmist in, from last week's psalm says, if I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell at the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me fast. We belong, one of the great confessions of faith of the Presbyterian Church, the Heidelberg Catechism starts by saying that our only comfort in life and in death is that we belong not to ourselves, but we belong to our blessed Savior, Jesus Christ. Maybe we say the same thing when we recite the Apostles' Creed, when we say that Jesus descended into hell because there is nowhere where we can escape the grasp of God. Martin Luther King, no stranger to beatings in prison in his great essay, Pilgrimage to Nonviolence, reflects on his experience of God in the midst of his struggle, and he says, I am convinced that the universe is under the control of a loving purpose, and that in the struggle for righteousness, human beings have cosmic companionship. Human beings have cosmic companionship. We belong to God, and the cosmic companion will never let us go. We have belonged to God from the very beginning, and we will belong to God in the very end. And the journey of the Spirit is understanding that whether it is affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, nothing can pull us away from the grasp of God. And the great mission of the church is to be the evidence of God's grasp in the world that every single person is held in the loving grasp of God. Which makes me think of the summer before my last year of seminary. Amanda and I, after having just gotten married, moved to Washington, D.C. I moved to Washington, D.C. to join her. We didn't have much money, we just got married. I needed a summer job very badly, but every attempt at a decent paying job failed. Every door of gainful employment closed. I was looking at three months of nothing. Not really a good way to hold up your end of the marriage after you just got married. Somebody told me about a ministry in the inner city, Washington DC, that needed some help. So there I went and they offered me a job a job without pay. Lord, I said, I, I need some money. <laughs> Trust me, God said, you need something more than money. So begrudgingly, I took the job without pay. 
the ministry was to the low-income elderly just off of 14th Street in what was then the red light district of Washington, D.C. Every day as I watched my bank account grow smaller, I was sent by the director to walk the neighborhoods and to find the elderly who had fallen far below the poverty line. And the director sent me in particular to visit a Mrs. Wellborn who lived in a ninth floor apartment of a rundown inner city project. And Mrs. Wellborn had been long neglected, painfully neglected. She had become mentally ill. She could not care for herself. She had no family or friends. She was violent by nature. Her apartment was roach infested. She had sores on her body bigger than my fist. She had several accidents that had not been cleaned up. Despite 95 degree days, she refused to open a window to her non-air conditioned apartment. I understood why she had no friends. The first time I visited her, she attempted to attack me. I went back to the director after my first visit and told her I wasn't going back. She said, yes, you are. I said, no, I'm not. I said, you know, it's not like you're paying me. <laughs> she said, I don't care, you're going back. So I went back and she sent me back there every week, sometimes more than once a week. And every time I went, I swore I'd never go back. There were no hallmark moments with Mrs. Wellborn. The irony of her name did not escape me. All told, I visited her dozens of times, and I felt like every time I visited that all the symptoms of a broken and sinful world had come to roost in that woman and in that place. If there was ever a God-forsaken place in the world, I think I experienced it whenever I walked into apartment 904. If ever there was a person who seemed separated from the love of God, it was Dorothy Wellborn. So at the end of the summer, with virtually no progress having been made with Mrs. Wellborn, at least in my eyes, I went to the director and asked, why did you do that? She said, why did I do what? I said, why did you keep sending me there? And she said that there were two people in apartment 904 that needed to learn about love, Dorothy Wellborn and Steve McConnell. Love is not a Hallmark movie. Love is presence. Love is showing to someone, showing to someone, and love is seeing from someone that we belong to God. Cosmic companionship. David Niven recounted once about the dark days of Dunkirk when the French and the Brits were being chased by the Nazi army to the shores of France. The Brits sent any ship they could to rescue whoever could make it to the beaches there. And one such ship, the Lancastria, filled up its berth with British troops to bring them back home. And just as she was pulling away, got struck by a German torpedo and began slowly sinking. From a ship close by, a Roman Catholic priest could see these soldiers in the hold with no hope and did the only thing he could think to do. He jumped and swam his way into the hold of the ship where all the men were trapped. He climbed in to be with them and in the last minutes of their lives, people reported that they could hear the soldiers singing, singing hymns being led by that priest. Does anyone know where the love of God goes? For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let us pray. We thank you, O oh God, that there's nowhere we can go that you do not hold us. Even though it doesn't feel it that way, even though we may wonder, 
even though we may ask the question, where does the love of God go? We thank you, O God, that you invite us to know and to wonder and to believe that you always have us within your grasp and that you will never let us go. In Jesus' name, amen.